Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. I'm so excited to present some of my work on um, the drivers of resident invasive species control action on the island of Hawaii. And I just want to say really briefly that um, I'm making this presentation a little bit interactive. And so um, you'll be having to raise your hands and maybe answer some questions. But feel free, if anything's unclear, as I'm going to ask me questions too. So we have a little bit of that two-way dialogue. Um, Awesome. So I just wanted to start off by today by having you all think for a moment about what comes to mind when you hear the words invasive species. So maybe when you think about invasive species, you think of a thorny star thistle you ran into while hiking, or maybe you think of a um, plant taking over one of your favorite parks here in the Bay Area. Or maybe you've seen signs like these um, when you're hiking or traveling or boating. Or maybe you've seen recent headlines in the newspaper asking you to eat invasive nutria. This is one of my favorite invasive species headlines. Um, so when I say invasive species, you might also think about the economic and ecological impacts of invasive species. So I'm sure many of you have seen these facts before, that invasive species pose um, a huge threat to the economy, to ecosystems, to habitat, ecosystem services, and are a leading cause of extinction of birds and mammals and fish. Now, I want to, before I move on, I want to take a quick poll of the room. So how many of you in this room have heard about invasive species before and know that they cause economic, ecological damage? Raise your hand. OK, makes sense, all of you. OK, <laughs> we're in the School of Earth Sciences. Um, now, raise your hand um, if, when I, when I say invasive species, you can think of a time where you actually controlled an invasive species on your property or in your neighborhood. Raise your hand. And no judgment, either way. OK, so many of you. Um, now, raise your hand if you feel like you can say that invasive species has impacted your livelihood or well-being significantly. A few of you, my committee. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Um, so what you can see just by this quick exercise is that while a lot of you think that, um, know about invasive species and see them as sort of a threat to ecosystems, to economies, not a lot of you feel like invasive species pose a significant threat to your livelihood and well-being. And so this would actually be really different in the communities where I do my work. And in these communities, um, basically everyone would be raising their hand in response to those last questions. Um, because invasive species are not just sort of a distant threat to ecosystems or parks and economies, but rather something that people are dealing with every day on their properties and in their communities. So um, I did my dissertation studies in the Puna district of the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, that's this district right here on the southeast corner of the Big Island. And um, the Puna district is what's called a complex social landscape. And what I mean by that is it's a highly subdivided landscape with a diversity of landowners. So you have sort of agricultural landowners, you have a lot of private public landowners, you have people living on these big properties in really rural areas, and then you also have um, people living in these really sort of more crowded subdivisions. Um, so one of them is this is Hawaiian Paradise Park here. This is actually one of the biggest subdivisions in the US with over 11,000 people living in it. Um, so despite this sort of diversity of land uses and ways of life, one thing that all of these residents have in common is they're constantly faced with an influx of invasive species coming in through transport and trade and often through the nursery trade. And these invasive species impact their everyday livelihoods. Okay, so um, before I move forward, I think it's worth briefly noting um, sort of the elephant in the room here. I'm sure many of you <laughs> have heard um, I heard basically seen headlines like this, um, that homes are burning due to lava. And you might be wondering, is this the communities that I work in? And indeed, it is. And so it's happening um, right now. The lava flow is happening in Leilani um, Estate Subdivision, which is um, one of the communities that I did a lot of this work in. Um, and so it has destroyed a lot of homes. And I just felt like it was necessary to mention this <laughs> before moving on and talking about invasive species, because this is something residents are going through right now. And it just goes to show you that um, residents in these areas are dealing with a um, sort of myriad of natural disasters and challenges and environmental threats and so it's not just invasive species even though that's what I'm going to focus on today. Okay so in my dissertation um, I studied two invasive species that have been plaguing the district. 
So the first one is Albizia. And um, Albizia is this giant tree that's native to um, the, the Molokan Islands, the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea. And it was actually brought over to the island of Hawaii purposefully um, as part of reforestation efforts that went very, very wrong. Um, and so people thought it was a good idea, but it ended up spreading throughout the whole island and causing all sorts of socioeconomic and ecological damage. So um, Albizia is a nitrogen fixing tree. So in Hawaii's nitrogen poor soils, um, it actually um, facilitates invasion by other damaging species. Um, it also overtops, so outcompetes native species like Ohia, Lehua. And, um, and Albizia um, basically has this low wood density and it um, grows really, really tall and forms sort of these canopies like a sail. So um, in high winds, it often falls over. Um, and so you can see this is a photo of it falling over onto roads um, after Tropical Storm Izel. And so that happened in 2014 um, when Tropical Storm came through the um, island of Hawaii. Albizia falling on infrastructure caused over $50 million in damage to residents' homes. So to just give you um, a brief understanding of how Albizia affects residents' livelihoods, I wanted to show you a brief video clip of um, Candice, my amazing research assistant, um, my, my first summer in Hawaii, talking about how Albizia affected her livelihood. And hopefully this is going to work. Yeah, I've had three fall on my face here. I've had a couple fall on my face there. Um, we can just come right across the street whenever we are crackling or whatever. We all run and hide in the back of the house. If it's windy, my kids aren't allowed to play outside because things may fall on them and stuff. So yeah, they definitely affect our life and limit what we do when we do it, depending on and what, what they're doing. <laughs> so you um, so yeah, so obviously you can see it affects whether her kids can play outside. She's constantly in fear of, of these trees. And so, um, so huge impact on people's everyday livelihoods. The other invasive species that I studied is a little fire ant. Um, and so little fire ant is not, so this is a photo of little fire ant and a tiny little chopstick that we use covered in peanut butter. Um, and the peanut butter attracts a little fire ant. And so you can see how tiny they are here. And um, they are not just invasive in Hawaii, but actually parts of Florida and lots of parts of the world. And so has anyone here actually had an experience with little fire ant before? We got it. We got a couple. Um, how was that experience? Does anyone want to share? <laughs> Rachel goes like this. Yeah. Um, so did something like this probably happen to you? Um, yeah, so, so little fire ant is pretty miserable. And so it causes these awful welts when it stings you. It also can cause blindness among native and domestic mammals. Um, this is a photo of a cat that went blind um, because of little fire ant bites in a home that we visited as part of our interviews. And um, little fire ant also causes a huge amount of economic damage. And so um, it facilitates the growth of aphid populations, which then obviously are a huge threat to agriculture. Um, and it's a hitchhiker. And so it's transported basically through building materials and, um, and along with people as they move around the island of Hawaii. OK, so back in 2015, um, when I first arrived in the Pune district, starting my PhD, I remember um, wandering around the Pune district. I remember hiking around and visiting all the beautiful waterfalls in Hilo. And as I was hiking, I would get little fire ant bites all over me. And I remember driving around and um, looking at both private and public lands. And there was albizia trees all over the place. And this was after Tropical Storm as well. Um, and I remember, um, I remember my advisor, Greg, turning to me and, um, and saying, OK, these invasive species are some of the most problematic, especially Albizia. People know that it poses a problem. Um, why, why do we still see it all over the place? Why is it still so widespread? Why aren't people doing something about this? And, um, and th that really got me thinking, and that's sort of what led to the birth of my dissertation work. And, um, and it was really this question of these um, little fire ant and albizia pose these sort of extreme cases of invasion that show that um, despite having an impact, a severe impact on people's livelihoods, um, not enough people are controlling them on private property to lead to widespread reductions in these populations. So I started wondering, what else is going on? What else is affecting people's decisions? making. What else do we need? What sort of policies and outreach programs might we need to get people to start managing these really damaging invasive species?
OK, so I started reading some of the literature um, after I had these key questions. And, um, and one thing that came up in the literature is that in these complex social landscapes like the Pune district, one reason why controlling these invasive species is so challenging is because control poses what's called a step level public goods collective action problem. And um, what I mean by that term is basically you need a sufficient number of landowners controlling on their property to achieve sustained and widespread landscape scale reductions in invader populations. And if you don't have a sufficient number of landowners controlling on their property, then the actions of those who are controlling are way less effective. Um, so to illustrate this, um, Let's pretend that your name is Sam, and uh, you live in this white house here in the Pune district. Um, this is an actual aerial photograph of the Pune district, one of my communities. And um, you're an upstanding citizen, so you go out every month, and you pull albizia saplings on your property and try to control them. However, your neighbors in the blue arrows here in these properties, um, we'll call them Bob and Jane, they're not controlling their albizia on their property. And so maybe they're absentee landowners, and so the albizia saplings on their property grow into these enormous stands that you can see from satellite imagery here and blow seedlings onto your property. And it's, so essentially, you're basically fighting a losing battle. You're going out there every month, pulling albizia saplings, and then more keep blowing onto your property. And, um, and so it's sort of a never-ending fight. And that's the predicament faced by many of the residents who I talked to in the Pune district. And this is basically the public goods collective action problem. So how do we overcome this? Um, how might we overcome this public goods collective action problem? Well, um, two approaches have typically been used by government agencies and conservation organizations. Um, so top-down penalties have been used. And so many of you have probably heard about noxious weed legislation. So there are laws for some invasive species that can, um, that can lead to landowners being fined for not controlling these invasive species on their property. Um, and then education and outreach about why invasive species are a problem. This is commonly used by a lot of different conservation organizations. However, such, um, such approaches have had fairly limited success. Um, and so top-down penalties, um, essentially it doesn't, they, First of all, they don't exist for a lot of invasive species that are already widespread. So things only get put on the noxious weed list if they're not already widespread, which is, <laughs> there you go, for a little fire ant, albizia, they're all over the place. Um, but even when they do exist, they often cause reactants, and they're difficult to enforce and take a lot of resources to enforce. You can imagine going back to our subdivision of Hawaiian Paradise Park, we have 11,000 different landowners. Imagine a government official going to every single property <laughs> and checking their property for invasive species. It's not really feasible. And then education and outreach, um, as we see with the case of little fire ant and albizia, um, that's not sufficient for achieving um, enough engagement to reduce invasive species populations. Um, and so we know with the cases of these species, people know about them, they know they're a problem, but yet they're not doing anything about them. So to better solve this problem, we really need more research, or at least I think so. <laughs> and in particular, we need to figure out two things. So the first thing we need to figure out is we need to identify what types of landowners are not engaging in invasive species control on their property. So who are those Bobs and Janes? So we can better target resources and policies to these landowners. <coughs> and the second thing we need to do is figure out how to get Sam, once again, that's you here in the red area, arrow, to not just keep controlling on her property indefinitely, but to actually go and try and recruit her neighbors or engage in collective actions across property boundaries. So we need to get Sam to go convince, teach Bob and Jane how to control on their property, convince them to control on their property, and organize sort of collective efforts. And the reason why we need to get Sam to do this is because there's a lot of literature showing that community leaders are often the most effective um, agents of change. So your neighbors are more likely to listen to you, to, your, to their neighbors, than they are to, say, a conservation organization or a government agency. And also sort of this community-based monitoring and enforcement by community leaders is less resource intensive than top-down policies and might lead to changes in community norms around invasive species control over time, which may um, facilitate sustained action over time. <laughs> 
OK, so this led me to my two main research questions that I um, sought to address through my dissertation work. So the first one, which I addressed through my chapters one and two, was what types of landowners are or are not engaging in invasive species control on their property? And the second question is, how can we, which I answered through my chapters three and four, is how can we get motivated residents to move beyond a focus on their own property to foster collective actions across properties for invasive species control? So I'll start off by reviewing some of the methods and uh, key findings from my chapters um, examining this first question on what types of landowners are or are not engaging in invasive species control. So to answer this question, um, I integrated remote sensing data on Albizia distributions with um, so property um, level socioeconomic data on landowner characteristics. And so I used um, a 2009 map of Albizia distributions created by Julie Gardner, one of my collaborators, from the Worldview 2 satellite. And then I used um, a 2016 map of Albizia distributions um, created from the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. So thank you, Greg. <laughs> and then I also integrated a 2013 Hawaii County tax map key. And I'll explain what this includes in a little bit. But this is publicly available data that includes property level um, socioeconomic characteristics. Um, and in my first chapter, I looked at um, how do those property level socioeconomic characteristics relate to those Albizia distributions in 2009. So, um, so sort of a static analysis, a cross-sectional analysis. And in my second chapter, I looked at how do changes in Albizia distributions over time relate to those property level characteristics. So to get a little bit closer to causality there. So this is, um, this is some of the data that I used. Over here, this is the TMK map, county TMK map. And so the yellow are the property boundaries here. Um, this is the volcano, in case you're wondering. Um, and um, the TMK data includes things like building presence, um, which is an indicator of absenteeism, building value, which is an indicator of landowner income, property size, homeowner exemption, and public versus private um, ownership. And then this is the Albizia change map that I created um, from between 2009 and 2016. And so the blue shows areas of decrease, the red shows areas of increase, and the yellow shows areas where there were Albizia in 2009 and it remained there during that time. So you can think of what I did as basically just overlaying sort of this map with this map and looking at how these characteristics related to these changes in these um, static distributions. So what, what did I find? I'm just going to share a couple of my key findings here, because um, I have a lot to go over today. Um, the first is that um, I found that there were fewer decreases and more increases on state managed lands. And so this shows the mean decrease on, on, um, on this property, and so on state lands, Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And you could see the decreases were around 66 and 69 percent compared to 78 and 75 percent on non-state lands. I also found that there were, um, there were more decreases and fewer increases on non-absentee and homeowner occupied land, as indicated by building presence and homeowner exemption. And so you can see here that the rates of decrease um, were a lot higher. And so this suggests these types of landowners are more likely to control on their property. And a third pattern I found is that lands with high building values are more likely to have decreases, less likely to have increases, and less likely to have Albizia in 2009. And so this graph right here is a partial dependency plot created from a gradient boosting model looking at the relationship between um, building value and Albizia probability. And what you could see here is there's sort of just um, a negative, pretty linear relationship between building value and Albizia probability. And um, basically what this suggests is that um, low income landowners are less likely to control on their property. They're more likely to have Albizia to start with. And, um, and going back to sort of thinking back to what Candace was saying about how Albizia influences people's livelihoods, this means you could start thinking of Albizia management as sort of an environmental justice issue. And so 
Actually, controlling Albizia is really costly, especially if Albizia is right next to people's homes. And so it could cost up to $5,000 per tree to remove it. And so, um, so it may just be too costly for these low-income landowners to manage. And, um, and so it really shows that these landowners um, may not have the resources to deal with it, and it's um, disproportionately affecting them and their livelihoods, which is, which is a huge problem. OK, so going back um, to this original question. What types of landowners are not managing invasive species on their property? Um, I found that low-income landowners may not have the resources to do this, renters and absentee landowners, and state agencies. And um, in the last couple slides of my presentation, I'll um, come back to some of these findings and talk about what they might mean for the design of invasive species policy and outreach programs. So now I wanted to move on um, to the second key question of my dissertation work. So this question of how can we get those, those motivated landowners, um, those, those SAMs who are already controlling on their property, to not just keep doing that indefinitely, but to actually sort of facilitate community-based control efforts across property bounds. Um, so when I was looking to answer this question, um, I had the pleasure of taking a deep dive into the literature on collective action. And, um, and one of the things that I found from this literature is um, that it suggested that when deciding whether or not to engage in collective action, people are, on, uh, um, people are often strongly influenced by the social or community context in which they're embedded. So they're often influenced by their perceptions of what others are thinking around them and what they think others are doing and what they think others might be doing. Um, so to illustrate this, I want to take a moment. Um, it's that part of the presentation. Um, <laughs> when, and have you all try and think of a time when you wanted to share information about or recruit people for a cause you cared about. Maybe this was an environmental or social cause or something in your household, um, but you ultimately decided not to. So just take a few seconds to try to come up with that example in your mind. Now, I would like you to think about why you ultimately decided not to recruit that person to share that information. What sort of thoughts were going through your mind that ultimately prevented you from reaching out to them? Does anyone want to share some of their thoughts? You don't have to share your whole entire story here, but just what are some of those barriers? What are some of those thoughts that prevented you from recruiting others? Emily. Uh, fear of judgment. Yeah. Exactly. Um, anyone else? Anyone else afraid of judgment? <laughs> yes, most people. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, that's a great example, and clearly a lot of you felt that way, where you're, you're thinking about, you clearly care about the cause, so it's not just your attitudes and values that affect, that's affecting your behavior, but it's really your perceptions of how you think others will respond to you. And so you're, you're making all these all these sort of quick um, assumptions about what other people are thinking, like maybe they don't really care about this cause, maybe they like, maybe they're gonna think I'm annoying, maybe that means they won't wanna get lunch with me in the future. And so this all starts going into your decision making and then you ultimately decide not to. And so in this way, perceptions of social or community context may be a stronger predictor of sort of collective action behaviors that actually involve engaging with other people than, say, individual behaviors that happen within the privacy of your own home. So I looked at two different components of um, perceptions of social or community context um, in, in this part of my dissertation work. And I'm going to focus on these two components because I found through numerous cross-sectional surveys that um, these two components are associated with residents' self-reported engagement in collective action behaviors for invasive species control. Um, and so the first component of social context that I'm going to talk about today is perceptions of norms, which I'm sure many of you have heard about before. And so social norms refer to be, um, perceptions of the prevalence of a behavior or attitude, as well as the social approval or disapproval associated with that behavior. So, um, so norms might be affecting people's engagement in collective action for invasive species control in a variety of ways. So let's go back to the case of Sam trying to decide whether or not to approach Bob and Jane. And so Sam might start thinking, OK, um, I want to approach Bob and Jane. Like, I don't want to be controlling invasive species on my property forever. But um, 
what are the norms in my community around invasive species control? Do people care about invasive species? Do they, are they also like annoyed with Albizia? Or maybe they're not. Um, do they, are they doing something about Albizia? And what does this all mean about how they might react if I approach them? Will they judge me, as Emily said? Um, and so this is um, so in this way, Sam may not approach her neighbors if she thinks that there's that there's not really a norm around invasive species control or around caring about invasive species control in her community. The other um, uh, aspect of social context that I want to talk about today is expected reciprocity, and this is basically this perception of if I take action, will others also take action? Or will I be alone in my actions? So once again, going back to the case of Sam, you can imagine if Sam feels like, oh, if I start knocking on doors about invasive species control and then all my neighbors are like, yeah, this is cool, let's do something about it. And then I inspire other people to start knocking on doors and suddenly we're all controlling Albizia together. If she thinks that's going to happen, then she might be more likely to start knocking on those doors to go and approach Bob and Jane. But if she thinks, I'm going to be knocking on doors, and then everyone's going to be like, why are you knocking on my door? Just, just stop. And then I'm going to just be the knock on door Albizia lady forever. Then she might decide, and I talked to a lot of residents who felt this way, and, she, and then she might decide to not, um, not approach them, to not try to facilitate that collective action across property boundaries. OK. so. So I found through a variety of surveys that um, norms and expected reciprocity are significantly correlated with resident self-reported collective action behavior for invasive species control. So this um, sort of started me thinking, and I remember um, Nicole at this point saying, well, what if you do an intervention? I was like, what? You can do an intervention on these things? And then, uh, um, and, and then I started thinking, OK, maybe we can change perceptions of social context, of community context, so of these norms and reciprocity to facilitate resident collective action across property boundaries. So maybe these are not just sort of static perceptions, like people have norm perceptions of norms and reciprocity around invasive species control, and that's just how it is. Maybe they're actually malleable. And maybe by changing them, we can get more people to start working together for invasive species control. Um, and, and I wanted to figure out if we can change these perceptions in particular through an intervention that can be easily integrated into conservation outreach approaches. So I wanted to say, is there a way to do this that can be easily integrated into how we do conservation work in the field? So to examine this question, um, I partnered with Franny Brewer, who is the outreach coordinator at the Big Island Invasive Species Committee which is a conservation organization on the island of um, Big Island of Hawaii. And um, Franny had been doing outreach meetings around invasive species control um, for several years now. And um, basically, her outreach meetings were going to communities um, and going to the sort of community centers, to residents' homes, and telling them about um, why invasive species posed a problem and what residents could do about it to control these invasive species. And, um, and in 2016, I remember her saying that she wanted to start a new outreach program around little fire ant control. Um, because little fire ant was starting to spread all throughout the Pune district. People were complaining about their animals going blind and getting all of these bites all over them. So she wanted to help out all these community members. But the challenge with little fire ant control is you really, to be effective, you really need people applying sort of the same pesticide treatment at the same time every month. Um, and Or else, basically, the little fire ant will move from one property to the other, and then your treatments won't be effective at all. So, um, so part of this challenge was she was thinking, we really need to get people um, to work together, to work together across um, property bounds. So this provided me with. Um, basically the perfect opportunity to examine this question of can we get people to work together across those property bounds by changing these perceptions of norms and reciprocity of community context. So to examine this, um, Franny and I and many other amazing collaborators and advisors designed a social influence intervention um, based on the social psychology literature and on um, collective action and norms and reciprocity. And the intervention was designed to change perceptions of community context, to change these perceptions of norms and reciprocity, to facilitate resident collective action for a little fire ant control. And, um, and the intervention included three key components, once again, from the literature, but that could also be integrated easily into outreach programs. 
So the first social influence component we added was increasing communication among residents through um, group discussion and um, towards a collective goal. And so previous studies have suggested basically that if you enhance communication, especially communication towards a collective goal or towards a collective problem, um, this can change norms around that problem. And, um, and it can do this because people make sort of these informal agreements about what they're going to do. So to, um, so to enhance communication and collective goal setting, I actually, um, we asked residents at the meeting to not just sit there and listen to Franny talk about little fire ant control, do what I'm doing right now. Instead, we asked them to turn to each other and actually talk about their shared experience with little fire ant control. Um, and, um, and what we found is with a lot of residents, they were like, you have a little fire ant too? You've been trying to control too? I thought you were the person not controlling and I was really mad at you. And so, um, so this sort of group discussion was really sort of effective at creating those sort of shared expectations and understanding. And we also had them engage in this collective goal setting um, process. And the idea here was to get them talking about specifically what they were going to do as a neighborhood. And so we had them fill out these uh, goal worksheets that I'm going to pass around the room right now. Um, and these basically just asked them to come up with a neighborhood goal around little fire ant control that was um, specific to their neighborhood. And so it wasn't, people always wanted to say, get rid of little fire ant everywhere. Um, but we wanted to create a proximal goal based on social psychology research um, that was actually achievable. So we asked them to say, approach, maybe your goal is like approaching eight of your neighbors and convincing them to control little fire ant on their property. So the second social influence strategy we incorporated was commitment making, public commitment making. So we actually had, um, once they created these collective goals, we had residents raise their hands if they're willing to commit towards working towards those collective goals. Um, so you could imagine if you're in this room, if you're Sam, now you've decided to control a little fire ant, you've already figured out Albizia, you come to this meeting, and, um, and then we say, okay, now raise your hand if you're willing to control little fire ant. And then everyone in the room raises their hand. And that was the case, because this was a community meeting of people who were coming to the meeting because they cared about little fire ant. Um, and so, but you can imagine if you look around the room and everyone's raising their hand, you might start to think, wow, like, People care about this. People want to do something about this. Maybe if I do something, and maybe if I start knocking on doors, they're not going to hate me. They're not going to judge me. They're going to be like, yeah, let's do this. Um, so in this way, public commitment making might um, sort of alter those perceptions of community context. And um, so the final social influence strategy we used was increasing the ob observability of contributions. So there's a lot of um, social psychology research that suggests that um, when you increase the observability of people's contributions to the collective, this often increases their contributions to the collective. And there's a variety of different mechanisms by which this might happen. Um, but one of them is that if you could actually see people engaging in a behavior, you might be more likely to think, oh, people are actually doing this. You might not assume that they're not doing it. And with little fire ant, um, you really can't see whether or not people are controlling little fire ant. And so we found that a lot of people were making the assumption that other people weren't controlling little fire ant. And so we wanted to change that assumption, make um, it so that it was visible to show other people that they were indeed engaging. And once again, that was hypothesized to change those perceptions of norms and reciprocity. So to increase the observability of contributions, I just had to bring my yard sign with me today. Um, we created these yard signs that said um, Little Fire is being controlled here. And we asked um, people to go home and put them up in their front yard. And now there are communities, um, I wouldn't say all the communities, but there are some where um, you're driving down the road and you see these Little Fire Ant signs on either side of the road. And you can imagine if you live in these communities, you see little fire ant signs all over the place. Every time you leave your, your house and every time you come back, you might start to think, wow, this is like, this is something my community values. This is something that my community cares about. OK, so, um, so this is what we hypothesized would happen. But we wanted to test if this was actually the case. So, um, so to test this, um, we ran a cluster randomized control trial. And so we enrolled 10 communities on the island of Hawaii in, um, in a new little fire ant community control program. And um, five of the communities um, were randomly assigned to be control communities. 
And they were given basically the traditional lecture um, from Franny, what she had been doing before, so, and what a lot of conservation organizations do for their outreach programs. So, um, so basically, Franny would come, tell people about Little Fire Ant, why it's a problem, what they need to do about it. Five other um, randomly signed communities were given an intervention. So they were given sort of the same lecture, same information, but then they were given these three additional social influence components that I talked about. And then we used pre, two month post, and seven month post surveys to look at um, whether perceptions of social context, so of norms and reciprocity, changed over time in the intervention and control communities, and whether self reported um, collective action behavior, so working with neighbors for Little Fire Ant, um, changed over time. So what did we find? Um, some preliminary, some, um, the first set of, sorry, these are not preliminary, I'm defending my dissertation. Um, <laughs> um, so the first set of results is that um, the intervention did change perceptions of community context. And so the intervention was a significant predictor of expected reciprocity and a marginally significant predictor of potential for social sanctions, which is sort of one way of looking at norms um, when using linear regression with clustered standard errors. And the adjusted impact of the intervention on these perceptions ranged from sort of a 0.388 to a 0.584 point increase in sort of a Likert scale type um, question compared to a control. Now, did these um, did the intervention intervention actually increase collective action for a little fire ant control? So um, this graph basically shows mean um, self-reported collective action behaviors. So this is working together with your neighbors, trying to convince a neighbor, teaching a neighbor about little fire ant control across property boundaries. Um, and it shows mean um, among those given the control and intervention before the meeting, two months after the meeting, and seven months after the meeting, and the 95% confidence intervals. And what you could see here is that at before the meeting, those in the control and intervention reported similar numbers of collective action behaviors. Um, but then at two and seven months, um, those in the intervention reported greater collective action behaviors. Although it's worth noting these results are not um, are only marginally statistically significant. So there's one other key result that I wanted to show you today that um, that I um, that I found interesting. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at through this research was whether um, there were significant moderators of the intervention effect. And so, um, so there's a growing body of um, literature suggesting that there's actually often an interaction between a, the person and the situation. So some types of people are more likely to be influenced by um, sort of their perceptions of social context, their fear of being judged than other people. And so we examined this um, by basically having sort of a value orientation scale in our pre-meeting surveys. And we looked at whether any of those value orientations moderated the impacts of the intervention. And we found that one value orientation did. And this was the orientation around um, people basically reporting that they really cared about being respected by other people. They cared about sort of their status, how they were viewed in their community. And for people who reported that this was important, and they also um, tended to score higher on sort of other more egoistic value orientations, um, the intervention really worked. So these results were highly statistically significant. Um, and so the intervention um, basically got these people to start engaging in collective action. Um, but for these people, they basically reported, I don't care what other people think about me. I'm going to just do my thing. I, I have like higher biospheric values. I have higher altruistic values. I'm just going to be the annoying little fire ant person, and I don't care. Um, the intervention didn't affect them at all. And so, um, so it's just worth noting that what the intervention really did was pull these people up to the level of these people who were going to do it anyway. OK. so. What does this all mean together? Um, basically, what I found so far is that um, I talked about the importance of enhancing resident engagement and collective action. We need sort of that community-based monitoring and enforcement. Um, and um, I found that perceptions of community context were, uh, were associated with uh, pe people's willingness to engage in collective action. And I found that we could use community-based social influence interventions to alter these perceptions of community context, which might then facilitate greater resident engagement and collective action among a subsample of people who care essentially what others think about them. So to wrap up my talk today, um, I wanted to re return to these two big questions that faced me at the beginning of my dissertation research um, when I arrived in Pune in 2015. And hopefully I have some 
few answers to them at this point. Um, so the first question is just, why are these invasive species still so widespread despite their significant impacts on livelihoods? What else is going on? Um, and so one thing that I found is absenteeism is, is contributing to the spread of these invasive species. Um, and while this has been suggested in sort of interview-based studies, it's been mostly anecdotal. And so this was one of the first studies to show that absenteeism actually is linked to conservation outcomes across time and space. I found that low-income landowners, renters, and state agencies um, are, are not controlling as much as other landowners, and so possibly because they may not have the resources for control efforts. And I found that low perceptions of community norms and reciprocity are inhibiting resident collective action across property bounds, and so residents are not working together across property bounds because there's no sort of supportive community context around that. So what does this all mean for how we can better control invasive species in complex social landscapes? Well, I'm going to offer um, sort of three different solutions. The first is that we really need increased support for low-income landowners, renters, and state agencies. And so um, this can take many forms, but one form is just subsidies to low-income landowners to help them deal with the cost of control efforts. And so the county of Hawaii has um, did recently have a voucher program um, to help residents with the cost of little fire ant control. And, um, and I found through preliminary interviews that the voucher program was a huge motivator for engaging in control efforts. And, um, and, and this is really important to consider given sort of the environmental justice issue that's posed by invasive species control in these landscapes. Um, the second thing I want to suggest is that we really need policies to manage invasive species on absentee lands. We can't just say that this is, it's probably not a big deal. We actually need to take the impact of absenteeism on conservation outcomes seriously. And so one of the ways we could do that is actually um, passing policies, and I know there's one up for consideration right now, that would allow um, adjacent landowners to enter absentee lands and be protected by law to actually remove invasive species and give those adjacent landowners um, resources to um, and, and funds to help support them in those efforts to enter absentee lands. And the third thing I'm going to suggest is that we really um, I, we could integrate community-based social influence interventions into our outreach approaches to facilitate sort of more collective action across property boundaries. So um, basically what I found is we can't just assume that we can go into communities and tell them, work together, this is little fire, it's a problem, this is how you control it, and people will work together. Um, rather, we need to create sort of a supportive community context that fills, facilitates that collective action. Um, so... That's all I have for today. Um, I'd love to take questions, and then after following Jen's model, I will do some acknowledgments. Thanks. <laughs> Sammy? Um, when you did the uh, like two months and seven month follow ups, mm -hmm. did you? just follow up with the people who actually came to the meeting and if you like what if, if you did follow up with other people like were there in the kind of communities that got the like special like fire at signs and everything did mm -hmm. norms change among like other members that weren't just like coming to the meeting that's a great question. I would love to be able to answer that. But no, I just followed up among those who attended the meetings to see if, so essentially I was thinking of my sample as a sample of sort of like opinion leaders here and seeing whether we could get the opinion leaders um, to change their perceptions of norms and reciprocity to get them to engage in more collective action. But I think that's an essential next step is like, okay, then how many people do they actually recruit? Um, what does that mean for like how this, how quickly this spreads throughout the community? I think, um, Future research, certainly. <laughs> yeah, Phil. Do you have any way to evaluate the efficacy of your treatment uh, to the fire ants on actual fire ants um, spread? Or I don't know if it's spread or uh, population. Do you have any way of actually measuring that? So, yeah, two responses. One is we used. Um, we partnered with the Hawaii Ant Lab for this, who had done a lot of research on, like, how you actually control a little fire ant, and that had taken years to sort of figure out, but it's basically a combination of an insect growth 
regulator that you put in peanut butter and then you spray up into trees and then you do that for six months and then you um, then you start a pesticide treatment for another six months and then you do this like forever um, and then hopefully it works um, and so it's just a little bit and um, and so we did we were using basically that um, that treatment that was done by ecologists but in terms of like that is also a question that I had hoped to answer is actually looking at like does this greater collective action lead to greater reductions in invasive species populations um, than sort of a traditional meeting? And you would, it would make sense because you're like, okay, more people are being recruited, more people are working together. You would think that would have sort of ecological impacts. Unfortunately, I can't tell you because I tried that and then my interns and I were going door to door trying to get enough uh, <laughs> houses to let us survey Little Fire Ant and their property and it was taking us two months and we got 40 households for um, all 10 communities, and um, eventually we gave up. But I think this is um, something that is, I, I actually am hoping to replicate this experiment in sort of another natural resource management context in which I could actually monitor the ecological outcomes, hopefully through remote sensing data to look at like, are there actual sustained changes? I think Little Fire Ant can't use remote sensing data, obviously, um, a little bit too challenging to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Thank you. I have two questions. The first one, did the landowner change over the 10 years? Uh, and second one, if it's uh, increase or decrease happened in the boundary of the landowner, how does that belong to each neighborhood? Oh, so the neighborhood, I'll answer the second one first. Um, the neighborhoods, in terms of boundaries, um, actually, I'll go back to my map of Pune, if that's OK, because um, the neighborhoods, conveniently, are quite separated. Um, and so it made for basically the boundaries between neighborhoods. We didn't have to worry about that as much if that's what you were, oh. Um, and so, so a lot of these, like, like we worked with this subdivision community here and then like this one and then this one. And you can see they're all sort of isolated communities. And so it did help with sort of the experimental approach there because it basically um, reduced any sort of chance for spillover um, between the communities. Um, I, that said, in terms of the actual treatment, like people from, like, say, Leilani do go to Ainaloa and may have seen the little fire ant signs. Um, so there is sort of the potential for spillover there. And what was your first question again? Well, the change of the three years of landowners. You have a lot of change of landowners. Or <laughs> just content? Yeah, so, so in terms of. Um, for those first couple of chapters, do the landowners change? Um, yeah, so that's a key limitation of the first chapter. So I basically used um, 2013 tax map key data and assumed that over sort of that seven year period, um, the land ownership would be the same, um, which is a limitation, certainly, because obviously there could have been a lot of changeover. And there is in this community. And so um, actually, it's one of the biggest growing populations um, because people are moving in um, from the mainland and are retiring there. It's one of the cheapest places in Hawaii to retire. So there's certainly a lot of people moving in. Um, so I think there are, uh, we, need, uh, we need future studies where looking at basically changes in land ownership over time and how that relates to changes in invasive species distribution. Cool. Yeah, so. um, yeah. um, so do you have information about only uh, perceptions of norms and reciprocity um, for these invasive species, or do you have idea about what those expectations are, the perceptions are, on other issues in these neighborhoods, too, are they generally kind of empathetic or not? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think that's. Um, one, so I, these were just measured for the specific context of invasive species. Um, I did ask a few questions around like broader social capital and so ideas of like how well do you get along with your neighbors? Like do you like your neighbors? How often do you talk to them? I didn't find that that changed over time, I think, because, um, but I did find through interviews, so I did go back and I interviewed a lot of the people who were part of the Little Fire Ant program and um, asked them about, like, so just tell me about the program, what happened, and a lot of them talked about how um, they're now basically working together with their neighbors on all sorts of other things because Little Fire Ant sort of started that, um, and so, so I have sort of qualitative data in support of that, not quantitative data, um, but a lot of people are like, now, like, my neighbor goes to Costco, and because it's, like, on the other side of the island, and um, they call me and ask if I need anything from Costco now that we work together in Little Fire Ant Control. And so there's a lot of different um, examples of that. Yeah. Yeah. This is related to the previous question. Um, what are 
what's the dynamics in these communities, right? You just mentioned that lots of people are moving in from the mainland. Is that something that came up in these community meetings about engaging neighbors or, or other folks? Like, people are more likely to work with people who've been there for a while as opposed to the, the folks from the mainland? Yeah. And then I guess just out of interest, because we're on this slide, yeah. how do you think the, the, the recent Activity, all activity is going to affect conservation activities in this area. Yeah. So um, the first with length of residence, I did. I have found in my cross-sectional surveys that length of residence is associated with more um, invasive species control action, which makes sense. Although really long residence, um, in some of my other studies, I found that basically people who are there for a long time actually came to see Albizia as like part of the landscape and something that they were really attached to. And so it sort of depends on the length <laughs> of living there. Um, but I, um, but yeah, I think that is certainly one of the biggest challenges and why there might be such sort of low perceptions of norms and reciprocity and social capital in these communities is because of this huge amount of turnover. And so you have people coming in who haven't even heard about invasive species and they're like, what's biting me? And, and so like, and so then the other landowners have to like teach them all these things, but it's easier to just live in your house and never interact with your neighbors. So yeah, that's, um, uh, that's a really great point. And in terms of the lava, I think, um, how it'll affect conservation activities. I mean, I, a, a first reaction is just like looking at this photo. It made me really sad because these are all dead Albizia trees that the community worked together to kill. And then it was like the lava was just going over them anyway. And I was like, oh. <laughs> but I, just, um, but I, I do think that um, one thing that's interesting, what happened in Tropical Storm Azelle with some of these disasters is a lot of residents reported that it actually like helped bring people um, closer together in a way, and so it. Um, and so I, I haven't measured that specifically, but it's just something that a lot of people talked about. Is like it was a horrible thing, but now we're like we're stuck together in this disaster shelter, and like I'm actually talking to my neighbors. And so, um, so I don't know if it, if there's a silver lining here of maybe that it'll help people. Um, talk even more and that'll sort of enhance social capital and, and trust and things and maybe they'll work together more on conservation issues or maybe it'll just be like it's not worth it it's because <laughs> the lava is just going to come through again so i yeah it's a good question <laughs> yeah rachel um i have two questions mm -hmm. sorry uh my first is so it seems to define absenteeism as someone that owns land but hasn't built a building exactly but I imagine in Hawaii, there's a lot of people that own land, own the building, but they only go there for like a couple weeks out of the year. Were you able to parse that signal out for absentee and not absentee, for the non absentees to figure out which ones are actually living there and who's, who's a vacationer? Totally. And then my second question is what were your conservation intervention suggestions for state owned plans, which also seem to struggle with uh, intervention? Absolutely. Um, so the first question, uh, here we go. So building presence, this is basically like true absentee landowners, although um, I'm going to talk about another caveat here, which is in these communities, uh, there's a lot of people squatting on land. Um, so this is not totally an accurate indicator of whether or not there's someone living there. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, and so, so it's not perfect, but um, this basically tells you if someone lives there ever or not. Um, or as a squatter. And um, homeowner exemption is basically what you were talking about. Is, it, is this their primary um, residence or not? And so this would be someone who was um, basically, um, maybe they had the status of the second home if this was, if they didn't have homeowner exemption. Um, so, um, but you could see they actually have pretty similar um, impacts sort of on decreases. Um, but, and actually homeowner exemption had sort of a slightly bigger impact on decreases, interestingly. Um, the second question um, was, remind me again, there was, uh, oh, policy. right, for state lands. That's a, that's a great question. I, and I haven't brought these results to the state agencies yet, and I would be, um, I mean, it's hard because they're so under-resourced, and they have these, like, huge expanses of land that they have to manage, and so it's just, like, just like world care about conservation, like fund our state conservation agencies. <laughs> I don't know if I have more specific um, policy guidance beyond that, but beyond just using these results to advocate for more sort of legislation to, to fund state agencies in terms of their, their management. 
But if you have any suggestions, we'd love to hear them at some point. <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay. Um, I just want to say some thank yous. Uh, I want to thank my committee members. Um, so I want to thank Greg for introducing me to the wild and wacky world of Pune. It'll always be part of me, so <laughs> thank you for that. And, um, and for also working with me on, on how we can integrate sort of social and ecological data in a really meaningful way. Um, I want to thank Nicole for teaching me so much about the behavioral sciences. I came in with a background in ecology, and she took me on despite this and taught me so much about the social sciences. And I mentioned this during the presentation, but when I just did a bunch of cross-sectional surveys, she's like, OK, now it's time to do an intervention. And I wouldn't have even thought about that. And I was just like, now I'm just so excited by it. So thank you for, for inspiring that. Um, I want to thank Rob for, for coming on and helping me deep dive deeper into really the collective action literature. And it's been so fun sort of like pulling in a lot of that theory and thinking about how can we sort of work with this in, in, in a sort of applied context and still learn things about theory. And so that's been a lot of fun working with you. I want to thank Peter for he um, really has been a huge connection um, to Hawaii for me and has helped keep keep me grounded um, basically in the study context and also in sort of what I can say about my data, which is it's really, really helpful to have someone who, who plays that role. And so thank you for being so supportive. Um, I want to thank my collaborators, supporters, Franny, Brewer, Springer K, everyone on the Big Island Invasive Species Committee. Obviously, you saw I couldn't have done this work without them. Um, I want to thank um, one other person here, Phil Broderick, um, has taught me so much about machine learning. I never thought I would do machine learning when starting my PhD, and now I'm like, yeah, gradient boosting models, SVMs. And so that's really fun, and I never thought I'd be able to do that. And so thank you, Phil, for teaching me so much about that. Um, I want to thank my research assistants. I asked them to do all sorts of crazy tasks, and they did them with so much enthusiasm. <laughs> and they taught me so much about Hawaii, and so like, they had to go, we had to go to like people's households um, to try to collect little fire ant data in people's backyards and like went door to door. And then we, Candace and I um, spent a whole summer standing on street corners begging people at gas stations um, to take our survey about Albizia management. And she was like, do we have to do this again? I was like, yep, 30 more days of this. Um, and she, she was like, okay, we got this. Um, so she was awesome. I want to thank everyone at all my different homes at um, Stanford and Carnegie my co-instructors for the classes that I taught while here. Um, all my different funding sources for this work, the Yiper staff, you all have been so supportive in these past couple months, helping me with both like conferences and workshops <laughs> and my defense. And so and it's been so helpful through all of that. I want to thank all my friends, family, and colleagues. And my dog, I couldn't end a presentation without a photo of my dog and a mountain. So here you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs>